I said, you are amazing, Sherelle. You're just the best. Anyway, let's um, thank you all for showing up again. I love seeing you all. I, I'm going to talk so quickly because I couldn't. I had to show you three artists, and I think they're all brilliant. Um, I, I couldn't help it. And I, I told you, I don't want to be in this one because I'm excited about what I'm talking about on Sunday. But today, these are three breathtakingly talented artists who I feel so lucky to have known their work. And I'm giving you all uh, an early Shabbat gift of three breathtakingly talented artists who think way out of the box. I'm not going to talk too much because I have videos of them speaking and about them, and then I'm going to show you their work. And then I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Please write in the chat and I will interrupt myself because, I mean, not myself, I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll answer your questions um, because I'm, I'm hoping you give me a few extra minutes. I'm watching my clock, but I want every second. So let's start with one of my favorite living artists. He's not even in my top 10. I went to see his words. His name is uh, uh, Christian Marclay, and he did a very famous uh, film called The Clock. And I made every student I teach everywhere go to see it. My daughter was at Harvard at the time. I made her go. I made everyone go to see the work. It's brilliant. The Israel Museum owns one of the, uh, together with the Tate Museum, one of them. So let's start with images of the clock. We're seeing two videos. Toby, do you want to start with the videos or with the- Yes, the videos, the videos, because then they'll hear, they'll understand what he's thinking about. He's just a genius. You know, I don't and have I don't, that yeah. much time. Time is, pre is precious. Um, so you have three minutes, right? Here you go. Hmm, time, that's a good question. I, I don't know what time is. Uh, I know that I have never enough time. You know, we're, we're obsessed with time and, and it, it's a stressful thing. You know, we're much happier when we don't have to think about time. You know, here in this film, you have to think about time constantly. So it's a kind of a meditation on time. So the clock is a 24-hour video. It's a loop. It never start. It starts when you enter it. There's no beginning. There's no end. Uh, it tracks time, real time, like like a, a clock, like a watch. Um, it's 24 hours, and when you see it, uh, the time on the um, screen is exactly the time on your watch. So it's real time. The piece is really about the present really, though it's made out of all these uh, fragments from the past. So basically I'm asking you to look at time go by. I mean, the clock is very much about death in a way. It, it is a memento mori, you know, the, the narrative gets interrupted constantly and you're constantly reminded of what time it is. So you know exactly how much time you spent in front of the clock. This is like you're, on your own terms. You decide when to enter it and when to leave it and uh, how much time you want to spend there. So there's constantly this push and pull between being sucked into fragments of narrative yet pulled back and uh, made aware of how much time has gone by. It, it's an odd experience. If I, if I told you to, to look at a clock for 24 hours, you'd go mad. Um, it would it would take forever, but here time also kind of tends to shrink, uh, but in a natural way. If you're engaged with it, then it, time goes by quickly. Yet if you're bored, uh, time seems endless. So I mean, it took three years to to create the clock. Um, the process of editing for me was the most fun. It's just like making uh, finding a logic between all these fragments and finding connecting bridges, finding cutaways that I could, you know, one action happens in one film and the reaction happens in another. Someone opens a door, enters a different world, a different film. This, these these uh, editing uh, tricks are used uh, to create this sense of continuity, this flow um, and this make belief in a way. So that's the idea behind the film. 
Now we're going to go to see the other one. I, I, I am so proud to send this, share this with you. The Clock is a real cinematic tour de force by the artist Christian Markley. It is a project he worked on for several years, thinking about moments that could be taken from different films that show the idea of time. People looking at watches, people looking at clocks, clocks tolling, and thinking about the way that time could become the subject of, of a unique work of art that really also comments on the history of cinema. A unique aspect of the clock is that it is synchronized to the real clocks. So if it's three o'clock in real life, it's three o'clock on the screen. And Markley has brilliantly woven together clips to give us this sense of artificial cinematic time fused with real time. Christian Markley's had a long career working with media, but also with images and sculpture and other pieces. Christian came here for an artist's residency, and he was an artist that was kind of perfect to be at the Walker because he works in many disciplines, and we as an organization have the opportunity to work with him in different disciplines. So the artist residency project that he did was in visual arts, in performing arts, and in film video. The clock is literally 24 hours of cinematic experience. But there's a storyline in it almost, even though it's disjointed and odd and coming around and around from one piece of film to another. It is a mesmerizing experience because it captures the sense of time and the passage of time. So those were the two videos. Um, these, I know I so you did see it. It's, 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 uh, it was, um, so the, he made a small edition of the film and then the Israel Museum and the Tate bought it together. And that meant that they can't show it at the same time. Uh, yes, it was shown at LACMA. And the reason I love it so much is, I don't know about you, but as a Jew, I'm always obsessed with time. Uh, always. Um, I am Shomer Shabbat, um, and Friday afternoons are always a rush for me, whether it's at a Shabbat starts at eight, uh, 7.30, like now, or at 3.30, as in, but it's time, and uh, the Chagim, all the holidays, and all preparation, like I'm the cook for the family, and, you know, trying to, I don't like taking away from my own work, so I, I cook late at night, or and I look at these images. Um, let's look at these images. They're just brilliant. And what he did is now this is one of the funniest ones ever. Now, anyone ever saw when Harry met Sally? I don't know if you remember that scene when he goes, I'll take what she had when she was faking an orgasm. Um, but what was interesting, I didn't remember the clock in that scene, but there was a clock in that scene. So that is funny. In other words, it takes you out of... Um, out of yourself. And I have to say, that is why I think he's, he should win a MacArthur. He's a genius to think about time in this way. Again, you know, high noon and all these things. I, no one, when they were making these films, did they think about the clock as being so significant, but when he takes it out, it's, it's brilliant. And I feel like I want to meet him desperately. He's a good friend of two of my friends, but every time we tried to arrange it. It didn't work out. But to think like this now, did he have a big staff? Yes. He had eight people working with him full time. Let's go again. Next one. I just love this because you see the reflection in the glass of the time, but it makes you remember different ways of clocks and digital and real. And it's just like things you don't think about. Let's go to the next one. I just, again, seeing all different clocks, like a, a, a big clock, a, it's just all different. And there you see, um, so let me tell you what I did. So it was showing the gallery in New York and there were deliciously, fantastically comfy chairs, big chairs, and you would sit there and then they did it at Lincoln Center. I have to say, I take a little credit for that because... Um, somebody at Lincoln Center who does programming called me and said, what do you think of the clock? And I said, oh my God, I love it. 
He goes, do you think we should do that here at Lincoln Center? And I said, oh my God, definitely. And he said, it's so interesting. Every artist that I called said the same thing. And that usually doesn't happen, but it was brilliant because think of a place like Lincoln Center that's all about opera and theater and dance. And, and then you put in something that's so esoteric about time. Let's go to the last one, I think, one more. And you know that's Orson Welles. And you just begin to realize how a clock can be beautiful and scary and sexy all at once. I think there's one more. And again, a stopwatch. You know, if you think of all the great races and you think about all the famous um, movies that have to do with time, about racing, it's just beautiful. And I think this is very Jewish. I, I don't even know what to say. I think all three artists, even though none of them are born Jewish, I think this is so Jewish. I think that's the last one, right? Yeah. So now we're going to go to Anne Hamilton. She's one of my favorite artists. Um, I just think she's a genius. She comes from uh, Canada. Uh, she lived in Canada. She's uh, um, she, uh, an MFA in sculpture um, at Yale. And this is a video of one of the pieces that, again, I took all our children to. Wait till you see this. I don't know if you have to share sound, I think. Yeah. Tomorrow, profound, executable, open agent and orb. A youth and poetry that may be true, an acceptance of one we've learned first to play with the toy. First hand is a sewing hand, is a weaving hand, is that um, connection between text and textiles. And the title of the work is The Event of the Thread. And that comes from Annie Albers, whose description of weaving is the horizontal and vertical crossing of a thread, which is touch and contact and intersection. The cloth is raising and lowering with the swings. Everyone's presence registers in some way in the materials of it, and that in turn makes its weaving. we wondered if people would even swing. We're like, I hope that they don't just hang there. There's something that happens when you swing. I'm sure there's a neurological explanation for the sense of pleasure that you feel. And I think people are giving it to that. There was a family in here yesterday that was here for three hours. So it's sort of become like a park. I, mean, I think one of the things that's here is it's very intimate and yet it's kind of very large and anonymous. So this kind of quality of solitude and um, being in a congregation or a group of people, I think the feeling of that is actually very comforting and something that we need. In the middle, under the cloth, I knew it would be a really wonderful place to stand to have the kind of turbulence and the liquidity of the cloth fall around you. But I, I was totally unprepared for the fact that people would lay down on the floor and stay horizontal for a long, long time.
I decided early on that I was going to stay for the duration of the show. And every day is a little bit different. And every day there's some other kind of interaction that it's almost a, it holds the piece back up to me. There was a girl who said that she felt really, really wild and safe at the same time. And when I heard that, you know, it's like, yes, that is great. And there's so many of those kinds of things. So you're trying to give or make the opportunity for a kind of experience, but not determine what that is. That in turn, there's so much that's coming back from what people are giving to the work. Being here and being present to feel that is like tremendously satisfying. Okay, we can stop it here. We can stop it here. So um, I just wanted you to understand that time is elastic. And he was showing you every second. And I loved um, that he talked about the fact that people went in to see his 24-hour presentation and sometimes stayed. Like, I was there. I almost missed nothing. My daughter and three of her friends that were in college camped out there from two in the morning till six in the morning. Um, and it was during finals and they all did well, not to worry, but there's some, and this is the exact, I wanted you to see time in a different way here. It's just about when the swings moved and the birds flew then and the, and the twine and the, everything moved and you felt like you were in heaven. I felt, and it was fascinating. I went there quite often and, on the swing, you had one experience, but when you lied on the floor in another one, and when you stood, it was a totally different experience. So lying, standing, sitting, all very different. Now, let me show you a few of her images. I want to give us like 20 minutes to discuss. So when I walked in the room, um, this is what I saw, and I loved it. There was no one there. So you could come at certain times, and you'd be the only one there. It, it's like amazing, because then it looks like a theater. Go to the next one. And there, the theater comes to life, and it feels very Shakespearean. And what's fascinating is people came who were alone and met people there, and there were many groups, including me. I brought my whole class, and we did it as a class assignment on sacred time. What does it mean? We have a six-hour class. What does it mean to be there for half of our class? Now, I'm usually having them paint during class. So I gave up half my time. It was even more because we had to take the subway there. And I made them bring uh, just a pencil and a pad. I said, I want no painting. I just want drawing and thoughts. Um, very powerful. Let's go to the next one. And there it's when it's solitude. You're up on a swing alone. There were kids who went into some of my students, you know, two or three tried to sit together, but I made them all go at least once alone because then you see you're in the space. Let's go to the next. And there is, you know, all the material and seeing all that and the birds on the side. Let's go to the next. So now we're going to, I, I'm doing this quickly. Now we're going to another one of my favorite artist in the world whose name is Sam Taylor Wood. She comes from England. She's really famous. Um, uh, she's done so many different things. She is OB, um, is, um, OBE means, I think she's the uh, order of, Eng I forgot, it's, it's a big uh, prestigious thing. It's not like being a rabbi, but um, order of the British Empire or something like that. She's a She's a, a very important person. So I'm showing you two of my favorite uh, um, time pieces. One is called A Still Life. We're not going to watch the whole thing. And the other one is called The Pieta. So let's start with The Still Life. It's one of them. I, I make every foundation painting class and see this right away. Thank you. 
I wanted you to see that. And now we're going to see one minute of the Pieta and then I'm leaving room. So I, I'm so excited you, lo you love this. Um, it's brilliant. It's done on a time-lapse camera. So it's, the camera stays there and then she splices it. And I wanted you to see this in relationship to the clock. So I am an, an educator. So I hope you see what I'm doing in your brains. Um, I hope it's working. If it's not working, then I'm the bad one, not you. Now, this is a Pieta. Um, I have to say, I've always been an observant Jew, but I always have loved the idea of love of a mother and a son. I don't think this is only Christian. Um, I, I admire Christianity for being so brilliant uh, of using the Pieta the way they did. But um, he's not dead. So his body, um, I'm talking, it doesn't matter because you can watch it anyway. He's most probably in his 20s and she's most probably in her 40s. So you have to see how hard it is for a mother. If somebody's dead, the weight is much stronger. And I just love, not like, love watching the way her body has to change. And every time I see a Pieta now, I'm fascinated by how beautiful. So she's 20 years older than him. But look at how she's trying. You see how the body, the arm moves, his neck moves. But that's because he's alive and she picks him back up again. I'm speechless. I, I, I think it's brilliant. Because if you believe that there was a man, whether you believe it or not, whether he's the child of God or not the child of God, if somebody dies, the mother holds the child afterwards. You see all these images. But it's very different when it's a grown, grown man and how strong his body is. You could watch it for all of seven minutes, but I, I just wanted you to see what she makes us think about. And you look at her neck and you look at her shoulders and you, you, it's just, I, I think it's brilliant. Now let's look at her images because I want to spend a, quite a bit of time talking to you today or you talking to me. So here she plays these other images. These are done with string. Um, and then she sets it up and then she photoshops getting rid of it. And she wants to show you how bodies move in, 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 um, in space. Let's go to the next one. Now, she did a great film and a great exhibition. Shirelle, have you ever seen this? It's, it's, it's called Men Crying. Uh, it, I, think, I, I think it's brilliant because 
it's so beautiful to see a woman. Everyone thinks of a woman crying, not a man crying. She's a woman looking at how men cry <coughs> in films. Like Christian Marclay took the clock out, she's taking scenes of men crying. I, I'm speechless at how brilliant they are because every man cries differently. There's not, and every woman does, but she wanted to do it as a woman looking at men crying. Let's go to the next. And that's, again, I, I love that, that whole idea of, you know, we are scrambling to be just staying on the tip of a chair. It's, I think this is the world. I think this is what it's all about. And it's about the, um, how, how strange life is and how you just have to try and stay afloat. So now that's the end. Now I want to spend the next 15 minutes. This is supposed to be a conversation. So now I'd like to, I hope you understood what I tried to do today. Um, and now I want to hear from you what you want me to talk about. But this was really about sacred time. What does it mean to understand that we're only on this planet for such a short time? How do you use that time? You know, I was, as anyone who knows me knows, I was very close to my mother. Uh, my father was more complicated, but I learned so much from him. And one of my favorite things he always would say to me is he was a European Jew, Holocaust survivor. His brother and sister were killed. And he said one of the things he missed, he minded so much hearing people in America say, I just want to kill some time. And he said to me, that is such a terrible thing to kill time. And I was a little boy when I heard it the first time. I'm not a little boy anymore. And it still sits with me so importantly that you should use every moment of time to your best. I'm not saying you shouldn't sleep or you shouldn't go to the movies or you shouldn't go to the beach. That's not killing time. That's enjoying life. But that concept of, oh, I don't know what to do. I just got to, you know, that. And that's what I wanted to show you with these three films. Like if you go on a swing for three hours, that's beautiful. Or if you watch a movie, that all those things are great. But it, your, your thinking is part of the creation. So that's all I want to say. I want to hear from everybody else. Yeah. Anybody want to say anything? I'd love to hear some comments because Fridays are supposed to be a, a conversation. Shirelle, is there anything that I should yeah, answer? Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, I'm just, <laughs> so one question is um, in terms of your own time, like in your own ways of marking time for yourself outside of like the uh, kind of given of Shabbat, is there a way for you in terms of the studio and your art that you do that? So I, uh, um, I map my days and I've done this all my life. Um, before I had children, it was very different. And now that my, our children are out of the house, it's different. So I tried, so I get up every morning. I, I have the same routine. I get up, I do a little work that I know that has to be done for the day. I take a shower. I daven, you know, I, I pray and meditate. I eat breakfast and I do that all. In, and then I get on my day. And every day I have a list of things I try and accomplish. I don't accomplish them all every day. And I try and be in the studio between 10 and 12 hours a day. That's my goal. 10 or 12 hours a day of work. But that means like when I'm teaching, I teach for six hours certain days. And those days, I'm only in the studio for six hours. In other words, I, but I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, and I try and spend a certain amount of time with my wife and with our children. And then I, I see a certain number of friends every week. And I use the phone as a way to communicate with, I talk to my sister who lives in Jerusalem every day. So I have certain things of what I do every day, but I try and accomplish something every day. And it doesn't have to be, you know, like a finished painting. It has to be, a, it could be a thought, it could be writing a lecture, but I, I use every day to the fullest. Oh, there's another question here, uh, mentioning the book, uh, The Sabbath by Rabbi Heschel. He talks about uh, the past 
in time. And if you have any thoughts about that and the connection between his ideas and the artists that you just uh, showed. So I'm so happy. I don't know who said that, but thank you. I love Heschel and I love The Sabbath. It was one of my favorite. That and Kandinsky. I love Kandinsky's book on spirituality, you know, and, and also Rav Cook. I mean, I'm fascinated with that idea of how time stretches. I mean, I, you should all read uh, Heschel. I think Heschel is one of the greatest thinkers, forgetting about Jews. He's just a great thinker. Um, I, 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 um, I so admire these three artists today I, and I so admire Heschel, but the reason I picked those three artists is they thought about different aspects of time. And that to me is fascinating. How you define time, like for instance, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I buy flowers for Shabbat. I love the idea of seeing something grow over Shabbat. I know that they'll eventually die, but I love their beauty and I change the water in the flowers and I try and have them live as long as they possibly can. The reason I love um, that still life is a fruit is a beautiful thing, but if you don't, it's going to eventually die. So it's not sad that you're eating it when it's good. It's good that you're eating it when it's good, because if you don't, it'll disintegrate. And I sort of think that metaphor of the fruit is each of our lives. You know what I mean? I, I really, I think it's important to use every moment that you have. You should all read Heschel's book, by the way. I'm so happy whoever brought that up. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, there's just, it's interesting. Um, there's this feeling and someone wrote, and I think it's true that like, you're trying to squeeze more, more and more, like when you're showing us things and more and more, yeah, in time. And I'm wondering like how you feel that struggle of slowing down and rushing forward with your own time. So I, I um, my wife and my kids will say, dad likes squeezing every second out of every moment. Like now I got a thing in my car and I talk to certain people that I have a certain amount of time. Like I know I have a half an hour drive from my home to the, to the studio. And I pick different friends of mine that I want to speak to for half an hour. Cause I'm not worrying if I'm painting, I've headphones on and I can talk while I'm painting, but I'm very conscious of not wasting anything. And on, on Shabbat, we go for a long walk. My wife and I, we entertain a lot on Shabbat. We have, very often 20 people somebody wrote a book on we have a, we have a big shabbat meal and and that to me is a great way to um use that time because i'm not going to actually do work work but i think there are different types of use of time um i do love the beach um when i was 19 cheryl you're going to get a kick out of this cheryl knows that my favorite city in the world outside of new york is tel aviv and I studied acting at Tel Aviv University. And when I was 18 years old, I, I took all these classes and I wouldn't have any classes before 11 o'clock because I wanted to, I lived on Ramad Aviv and I, my apartment was a bicycle, five minute bicycle ride from the beach. And I would get up, get to the beach and stay for like two hours and my kids can't believe I did it, but I was 18 and I was not now. I wouldn't do it now, but I treasure those memories so, they're so powerful. So I, yes, I do think I try and squeeze every minute out of time and I think everybody should. There's um, one thing, the art that you showed us today was, uh, you know, film and installation and photography. And I wonder if you can say a few words about time in paintings, which I think is well, a whole different yes. thing. Yes. Well, so Rothko is one of my favorite artists that ever was in the planet. Um, uh, Cezanne, I, I love the way Cezanne looked at time. I love the way Monet looked at time. Um, I love the way Pizarro looked at time. I can name you a hundred artists that are very, oh, David Hockney, California, the way he does that beautiful light in California. Um, oh, oh, oh my God. Doug Wheeler. One of, I, I think he's like one of the great, I mean, everyone knows James Terrell, but I think Doug Wheeler, the way he plays with light. 
um, uh, um, uh, a lot of the German artists, the luminist painters. Um, yes, how, I think did you, how did you experience time as a painter? Well, I, I, um, I try and uh, I give myself amounts of time. Like I'm now working on a series of drawings for a museum show that's opening in November. So I, I know how much work has to be get done on an image. I wish I could take the, the, uh, the video downstairs. I have two floors in my studio and I'm finishing up a painting that's going to La Jolla um, uh, next week. And I've been working on it for six months. So these last two weeks, I spend an hour and a half every day just doing light glazing. Because if I try and do it in one day, I'll ruin it because it's very, very subtle shifts in color. So my days, when I get to the studio, I have a very large studio, it's divided in different sections and I work on different things simultaneously. And are there paintings that are very quick for you or are they all like, how would you kind of uh, uh, describe how long does a painting take? Is there a, a, a kind of average or does it change based on the painting? Well, the, the paintings are really, I'm a conceptual artist. So everything starts in my head. So it sometimes can take, you know, 10 years to get what I want out of my head onto the canvas. But um, on the work, I take a photograph first. I then, now I use a computer. I used to use black and white paint. I, I finish the photograph and then I isolate everything I don't want on the painting anymore, on the image. Then I put it on handmade paper. Then I start building up a surface and think about colors. And then I finish the painting on paper. If I like it enough, I then will spend six months on doing a large one. The large ones take me much more, it's all about layers. So the smaller works um, always will take me at least three weeks to a month, but that's from thought to drawing to painting on paper. So I just want to see if we have a couple more questions or comments, if we have. I'll also mention we had a, uh, the clock appeared, uh, was exhibited also in uh, Tel Aviv Museum of Art. And when it was, they had for uh, three occasions throughout the exhibition, they opened the museum for the night. Because otherwise, no one sees the work uh, when the museum is closed. So they opened it and we went there at night to see the the continuation of it so we don't see only the day itself right. well, all the galleries and all the institutions as it was lincoln center that was part of christian mark clay's decision that you had to have the institution open for 24 hours um yeah i i really want to hear more from you guys like does anyone feel like when you looked at these films it, it makes you feel like you want to do things differently with your day that's if you'd say to me, what was my goal for today? My goal for today is that each of you think in your own way, not in my way, but in your own way, what time means to you. Um, you know, my wife loves Havdalah and she loves lighting the candles and she spends more time doing, I'm the cook in the family, so she's not cooking um, before doing that, but she gets into that zone. Um, I enjoy um, putting on my tefillin. That is a sacred time for me. That's more meditation than prayer. Um, but I'm sure all of you have things in your life that you don't realize. Like, all right, I'll give you an example. I'm a cook. I love, not like, don't love chopping, but I love putting in spices. I don't know if you know Adolenghi. I love Adolenghi. If you don't know Adolenghi, I think he's one of the best greatest chefs. I had the great privilege of meeting him when I was in London because one of my wife's best friend is the publisher of his books. He did Jerusalem. He's, he's done many great cookbooks, but I told him when we were sitting in his restaurant, I, he, I said, you know, I really wanted to meet you. I love the way you think about spice. And I love the way you, you know, cut it certain things bigger and certain things smaller and the order that you put things in. You know, that to me is, that to me is sacred time. I, I don't like preparing my, my herbs and things. I love that. 
So I'm saying think about what in your life brings you joy and spend more of the time doing that than other things. Toby, I want to thank you so much. Our time is up. <laughs> But uh, hopefully we all have what to take with us into this Friday. And uh, I think someone here mentioned the preciousness of time uh, and just finding our own ways to use it. So thank you for sending us uh, with these gifts for Shabbat. Um, I hope to see you all on Sunday. And uh, have a beautiful Friday and Shabbat Shalom. Bye, one everyone. second before you leave. Let me tell you one thing. Every human being that had their images of themselves on the screen, that to me was a present of time. Because I know that people have to sometimes take their screens off. But when I see people's faces, that to me is like communication. You know, Nessa always tells me I learn more from people's faces than I do from what they write. So um, I really appreciate seeing your faces and have a wonderful Shabbat. Thank Cheryl, you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Shabbat Shalom. You and I are staying on, right, Cheryl? Cheryl? Well, uh, I'll reopen a room. I'll send All you right. in. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.